Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and now we're back to part two of rocks part one. All right, so we just had a quick discussion about plutonic rocks and now let's think about volcanic rocks. So in terms of volcanic rocks, also called extrusive rocks, there are actually two different types. We have rocks which are produced by the lava flow itself and we have rocks which are produced during explosive volcanic eruptions. Now they're referred to as either pyroclastic or volcanoclastic rocks. The two terms are pretty much interchangeable. Now, as we know, once again, our magmas fall into one of four types, felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. And we know that the compositions of these magmas are different and the temperatures of these magmas are different. So we're going to get different minerals associated with each type of magma. So when we look at something like a kamatiite, we know it's going to be dominated by olivine, a bit of pyroxene. Mafic igneous rocks are going to be dominated by lots of pyroxene and lots of calcium plagioclase feldspar. Intermediate igneous rocks, well, they're going to be dominated by a lot of uh, plagioclase feldspar, more sodium rich plagioclase feldspar at this point. But also because there's a little bit of ferromagnesium, well, a little bit of iron and magnesium in the magma as well. You're also going to get some darker minerals present, so you're going to get things like uh, amphibole and biotite appearing. And then at this end of the scale, we have um, lots of sodium, lots of potassium, lots of aluminum, lots of silicon. So we're going to end up forming quite light coloured minerals. So as we go from felsic to ultramafic, we're going to have a steadily, steady darkening of the colour of the rock. So, you know. That's the first way that we classify extrusive igneous rocks. We simply look at the color of them. So if we look at them here, what do we have? Well, we can see we have the rhyolite here, so that's felsic, the andesite here, intermediate, the basalt here, mafic, and the kamatiite here, that's ultramafic. Now, you might have noticed a couple of times that when kamatiite appears, it has a little asterisk next to it. And that's simply because kamatiites aren't formed anymore. They're not erupted on the surface of the earth. So the last time we had Kamatiites really being erupted was all the way back in the Precambrian. And so that means if you want to go and find a fresh Kamatiite sample, you can't. They're all very, very old, and typically they're all very, very altered. And so the colour of this rock that we have here is not the colour it would have had when it originally formed. So this isn't representative. But nevertheless, what we can see is we can see there is a clear darkening as we go from felsic through intermediate and into mafic. And that's a reflection of the magma composition. So that's the first way we can work out what our extrusive igneous rock might be. Now, the other way we work it out is using the phenocrysts. So if we go, we go back for a second, you can quite clearly see we, you know, we can't really see the crystals. We, now, where we can see the crystals are where we have a porphyritic texture. So you can see in this sample, we can see crystals there. And if you look, we can also see there are small olivine crystals right here in this basalt. So there are some phenocrysts. Now, we can use those to our advantage. And we can can use them to classify our rock. So if we look here, we have our three types of rock, rhyolite, andesite, and basalt. Kamatiite is not included because we don't have any fresh kamatiites. So if we look at these different types of rock, we can start to see which types of phenocris we would expect. Now, if we look here, you can see there's a star rating. One star is rare, two stars is often present, three stars is frequently present. So in the case of a basalt, you can see we, we would expect to see maybe plagioclase phenocris, olivine phenocris, pyroxene phenocris, maybe hornblende, and maybe some titanium iron oxides. Now you're thinking, well, nothing really stands out there, does it? There's no one type of phenocris which is you know, definitely going to appear. However, olivine. Olivine is the only, well, olivine is the, it will only turn up in basalts. Doesn't appear in andesites, doesn't appear in rhyolites. So if we find ourselves a volcanic rock that contains olivine phenocrysts, well, clearly we're going to have to say it's probably a basalt. In terms of andesites, well, andesites very, very commonly have plagioclase phenocrysts. They'll, they'll also quite commonly have hornblende phenocrysts as well. So if we come back here, what can we see? We can see in this case we have these you know, creamy white colour crystals, 
that's going to be the plagioclase feldspar. So we can see loads and loads of plagioclase feldspar, kind of medium grayish color, kind of an intermediate color. That's going to suggest to us probably an andesite. When it comes to rhyolites, well, we typically get large quantities of potassium feldspar phenocris and some quartz phenocris as well. Once again, you'll notice that potassium feldspar and quartz don't really appear in either basalt or andesite. So if we start seeing potassium feldspar or quartz phenocris, well, we have to be looking at something which is felsic in composition. So we're looking at a rhyolite. So even if the color is somewhat different, we can use the phenocris to help us work out which type of uh, lava-related volcanic igneous rock we're looking at. So color and phenocris, that's what's going to help us classify our volcanic igneous rocks, so those which are formed from, from lavas, or lava flows, should I say. Now, the other type of extrusive igneous rock we have are the pyroclastic or volcanoclastic igneous rocks, and they are produced during explosive eruptions. So these rocks consist of a large quantity of essentially clasts, fragments of both rock but they also have pieces of magma which are thrown into the air. Okay, So obviously during the explosion you have lots of rock and dust going flying into the air, but then you also have lots of little flecks, lots of little blobs of magma will also be thrown into the air as well. And these little blobs of magma can cool and they can form different sized particles. So for instance, you know, if you have very, very small blobs of magma, they'll cool in the air and they'll produce ash. Then if you have slightly larger blobs, they can produce lapilli. And quite large blobs of magma as they get thrown into the air can end up forming things like blocks. The most common form of a block is something like a volcanic bomb. Now, I should also point out that the term um, lapilli and blocks is also used in regard to rock that's just been blown up. Okay, so it's nothing to do with you know a, the magma flow, the lava flow that's causing the eruption well, results from the eruption, was is produced as part of the eruption, should I say. But, you know, it's all just part of the explosive portion where the rock that's there originally gets destroyed. The term ash, though, is only really associated with small flecks of magma that get thrown into the air. If it's a very fine particle created from the destruction of the pre-existing rock, that's typically referred to as dust. So, depending on how much ash, lapilli and blocks we have in our pyroclastic rock that's going to help us work out or should I say classify what type of rock we have. So if we look at these eruptions here what do we have? Well here we have a couple of examples Mount St Helens before and after, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines you know, during the Pinatubo eruption from 1990 I think. So what we can see is during both of these eruptions, we obviously have a very explosive event. So number one, we have the pre-existing rock that gets blown up. That's going to create lots of dust. It's going to create lots of you know, intermediate sized fragments, lapilli, and it's going to create lots of larger fragments, blocks. We also obviously have the magma that gets thrown into the air as part of the explosion. Those very, very fine particles are going to crystallize out to give us ash. The intermediate sized blobs, well, they're going to crystallize out and they're going to give us lapilli. And the large blobs of magma that get thrown into the air, into the air they're going to crystallize and they're going, well, they're going to cool down and they're going to form uh, blocks. So we're going to end up with all these different sized particles as part of our eruption. And so, as discussed, we can use these particles to classify our rocks. So here we actually have some volcanic ash. You can see how fine it is. And this is looking at it down the electron microscopes. This is actually a, a you know an individual uh, ash particle. And so what we can see, well, number one, obviously very, very fine. But this essentially is just a piece of magma that just got launched into the air and cooled down as it was flying through the air. Lapilli, well, they can be, as I said, pieces of pre-existing rock that's just been blown up and thrown away, or sometimes lapilli can actually form from aggregates of ash. You can get loads and loads of ash particles that stick together as part of the eruption, and they'll form a lapilli. 
So lapilli can be produced from ash or they can be produced by from pre-existing rock that just gets blown up. So when it comes to classifying our uh, pyroclastic rocks, our volcanoclastic rocks, how do we do it? Well here we have a triangular diagram that's going to help us do this. So we have ash at this end of the scale, lapilli at this end of the scale, and blocks at this end of the scale. Now typically most uh, volcanoclastic rocks are dominated by ash and lapilli. So they're going to most of them will fall somewhere along this line here. Okay, they don't often contain large quantities of blocks. So what this diagram essentially is saying is, is when it comes to ash, this is zero percent ash along this line, and one hundred percent ash at this point right here. In terms of lapilli, this line here represents zero percent lapilli and we have 100% lapilli here. In terms of blocks, this line here rep represents 0% blocks, and this point right here represents 100% blocks. So we're essentially going 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, as we come across. And so all we do is we just try and work out the relative proportions of ash, lapilli, and blocks in our volcanoclastic rocks. Now as I said, most volcanoclastic rocks do not contain many blocks, so they're a relatively low proportion. So most volcanoclastic rocks are going to fall somewhere along this line because they will normally have 0% blocks. And so if your volcanoclastic rock is dominated by ash, you would classify it as a tuff. If it's dominated by lapilli, it would be a lapilli stone. If it falls anywhere in between, you've got yourself a lapilli tuff. And to be honest, the vast majority of volcanoclastic rocks are going to fall into the lapilli tuff field. Now, I should point out, by the way, that tuff is different to pumice. Okay, now I'm sure you all, you've all heard of pumice and chances are you looked at some pumice samples uh, during your earlier courses. But tuff and pumice are not produced by the same process. So they're actually separate rocks. So what about the volatiles that we discussed earlier? So as mentioned, uh, as you go from ultramafic to felsic, the amount of volatiles in your magma increases. And we've also touched on the fact that how these, you know, these increased volatiles will lead to more explosive eruptions. So felsic and intermediate magmas are commonly associated with not only rocks produced by lava flows, but also, you know, volcanoclastic rocks produced by an explosive portion of the eruption. In contrast, mafic and ultramafic uh, ultra Ultramafic rocks are not commonly associated with explosive eruptions, so you don't really get many pyroclastic rocks forming, and that means the vast majority of igneous rocks associated with those types of magmas, when they erupt, when they're you know extruded onto the surface of the earth, are going to be formed from lava flows. So, if you have a lava flow that's being erupted onto the surface of the earth and it contains uh, volatiles, those volatiles will typically be in the form of bubbles, gas bubbles. And so depending on whether the gas bubbles can or can't escape from the magma, well that means you're going to see them. So if you imagine you have a magma that's quite sticky and it's full of gas, well you're going to have lots and lots of gas bubbles. And because the lava is quite sticky, those gas bubbles are going to have a very difficult time escaping. And so what's going to happen is that lava is going to cool before most of those gas bubbles can get away. And so you're going to end up with a lava flow that contains lots and lots of gas bubbles in it. And that means when you look at the lava flow, it's going to look a lot like Swiss cheese. It's going to have what we refer to as a vesicular texture. And vesicular textures are commonly associated with uh, both uh, rhyolites, andesites, and basalts as well. So even basalts with their very very low uh, volatile content can still form enough gas bubbles to produce a vesicular texture. So there are two types of igneous rocks in uh, should I say there are two types of extrusive igneous rocks in particular that have a very highly vesicular texture. Those are pumice and scoria. 
and you can see both of them are absolutely stuffed with these voids, these vesicles. And each one of these represents a gas bubble that got stuck in the lava as it cooled down. Now if we look at both of them, the first, one of the things you would also notice is just how light they would be when you, when you pick them up, because there's just so much open space within the rock. So in terms of what we can see when we look at the pictures, pumice is light in color, scoria is quite dark in color. The scoria will actually um, oxidize very, very quickly, and it will take on a very, very distinct rusty red color. Pumice will typically form from felsic to intermediate lava, Scoria will form from, well, maybe intermediate, but most commonly mafic. Pumice has also formed from a very, very high viscosity lava. Scoria will typically form from quite a low viscosity lava because the lava is mafic. The, so that means the gas bubbles in the high viscosity lava flow have a lot of difficulty escaping, hence the fact they get trapped before the lava, you know, when the lava flow cools down. In the case of the scoria, what's causing these uh, gas bubbles to get caught is the fact that this is such a hot lava, but it comes it's suddenly being you know exposed to such a cold environment. So let's think of a basaltic flow, you know, a basalt being erupted onto the surface of the earth. You know, those lavas can be hot, you know, anywhere between 1,000 to 1,200 Celsius. I mean, really, really hot. And so let's imagine, you know, it's coming out at 1,000 degrees Celsius. Well, that's a, you know, a very, very hot magma being extruded into an environment of 25 degrees Celsius. So that's a difference of 975 degrees Celsius between the lava and the environment into which it's being erupted. So that means that lava is going to cool down fast. And it cools down so fast that the gas bubbles do not have time to escape. And so we end up with this vesicular texture. So even though the lava viscosity is very, very low, so if it had enough time, the gas bubbles would all be able to escape. They can't escape because the lava crystallizes so quickly. In the case of pumice, well, once again, we have a very, very high volatile content. So that means there's going to be lots and lots of gas bubbles. In the case of the scoria, well, uh, mafic magmas tend to have much, much, much lower uh, volatile content, so we'll typically have a lower vesicle count. In the case of pumice, we have abundant small vesicles. That's because each of these individual gas bubbles, you know, didn't have time to merge together to form larger ones. Remember, the lava is very, very sticky, so those gas bubbles can't merge together very, very easily. In contrast, when it comes to the uh, mafic lava here, well, all the gas bubbles, they can move through the lava quite easily because it's quite a low viscosity. And so that means all those smaller bubbles will aggregate together to form large bubbles. So you can see we have noticeably larger vesicles in the scoria when compared to the pumice. And that's a reflection of the magma viscosity. Now, in terms of pumice, because there are so many voids in this rock, so many vesicles, this rock is actually more open space than rock. It's got more air in it than rock. And so if you take pumice and you drop it in water, it will float. In contrast, scoria, because it's more rock than vesicle, when you drop that in water, it will sink. So both of these types of rocks are being produced uh, during parts of the eruption where we have lots and lots of volatile uh, volatiles escaping. So our next concern is how are we actually making our magmas? Well, we can actually create magma in one of three ways, and we're going to discuss those ways in a second. But first, let's cover a few basic points. Now, obviously, in order to make a magma, you obviously have to melt a pre-existing rock. That's you know, not really difficult to understand. Now, in order to actually uh, make a magma and make something, you know, have it move, you need to melt a minimum of 20% of the rock. So if you melt 10% of rock, yes, you are going to create some magma, but those little blobs of magma that you create will all be separated from each other, so they can't join together and flow out of the rock. 
you have to melt about 20% of the rock before you have enough of those little blobs of magma for them to start joining together, making a network so the magma can flow out of the rock. So you need to melt that minimum 20%. Now, in terms of rocks, that rocks have what are what's referred to as a liquidus and a solidus, and the names are pretty much as what you, what you would expect. So the liquidus is the temperature above which the rock is 100% liquid. The solidus is the temperature below which the rock is 100% solid. Now, the liquidus and the solidus are normally not the same number. So please remember that. So that means that means you have this gap in between the liquidus and the solidus. So in that gap, what's going to happen is your rock is going to be partially melted. So it's going to have some liquid, so some magma, but it's also going to have some solid crystals. So, you know, leftovers, essentially. So once again, liquidus, temperature above which the rock is 100% liquid. Solidus temperature below which your rock is 100% solid and the space in between these two uh, limits is essentially a field in which you will have a mixture of both magma and solid crystals. Now the rock will begin to melt once the temperature exceeds the solidus and now obviously because a rock consists typically of more than one mineral it will actually start melting when the temperature well in the solidus of the lowest temperature mineral is passed so we need to remember that the position of the liquidus and solidus will change with pressure so typically if you want to melt a rock the higher the pressure the more difficult it is to melt that rock okay so that's something that always has to be you know uh, uh, born in mind okay so how are we going to produce our magma well we can do it in one of three ways through temperature pressure or volatiles those are our choices okay so how are we going to melt our rock essentially well the first method is quite simple increase the temperature so the solidus for mantle rocks is typically well above the ambient temperature. So let's look at this graph down here. So this is something which is referred to as the geotherm. So this is the temperature gradient as you go down into the Earth. So we're looking at the top 200 kilometers of the Earth, and we can see that the temperature steadily increases the deeper you go into the Earth, which isn't a huge surprise. Now this dash line here represents the melting curve for peridotite. So this is the peridotite solidus. When you're on this side of it, your peridotite is 100% solid. Once you're on this side of it, your peridotite is beginning to melt. So what's going on? Well, we can see that um, the geotherm and the melting curve are not in contact, are they? So that means your peridotite will not be melting. So in order to make your peridotite melt, we need to drive this geotherm over to the melting curve. Now the only way we can do that in this instance is by increasing the temperature. If we increase the temperature we obviously increase the geotherm and we're pushing it over towards the right because we're increasing the temperature aren't we? So we're driving the geotherm this way. And so eventually, if you can get expose your rock to enough heat, you will drive it to the point where the geotherm will intersect the melting curve and your peridotite will start melting. And that will give you a mafic or ultramafic magma. In the case of forming intermediate and uh, felsic magmas, you will typically form those through the melting of continental crust, in this case marked out by this red line here, which is the melting curve for granite. And so once again, if you just drive the geotherm over to the right, eventually the geotherm will intersect the melting curve for granite, and the granite will start melting. So the next question is, is well, how do we manage to heat up our rocks to the point where they start melting? And it's actually a little bit difficult to do. I mean, you would obviously say, right, just bury them deeper. The deeper they go, the higher the temperature gets. 
The problem is, the deeper they go, the higher the pressure is. And as we just discussed, higher the, the higher the pressure, the more difficult it is to melt your rock. So what we need to do is we somehow need to get our rocks in contact with something that increases the temperature very, very quickly. And the most common way to do that is simply put your rock in contact with a magma, which is of much higher temperature. So in the case of something like a, a piece of continental crust, if you have a load of mafic or ultramafic magma pooling at the bottom of that piece of continental crust, the heat from that magma will be sufficient to start melting the continental crust, and that will produce a felsic or intermediate magma by melting the continental crust. In contrast, if we want to make ourselves a mafic or ultramafic magma, we have to start melting mantle peridotites. And the best way of doing that, simply by using heat, is to you know, throw up a mantle plume. So if you remember, a mantle plume is produced by magma, uh, is it, essentially it's a ball of magma that comes flying up from the core mantle boundary. And this ball of magma is hot. It is very, very hot. And so as it starts rising through the mantle, and in particular passing through the upper mantle, the sheer temperature, the sheer heat from that mantle plume will be sufficient to induce the uh, mantle peridotites into melting. And that will obviously give us a mafic or ultramafic magma. So the first way of causing melting is simply ratchet up the temperature. Okay, what's our next method of melting? Well, the next method of melting is decompression melting. So this is when we don't change the temperature but we simply drop the pressure. So, as discussed, higher the pressure, the more difficult it is to melt something. The lower the pressure, the easier it is. So if we can take a rock that's under a high temperature and a high pressure, and rather quickly drop that pressure, well then what we have is we have a hot rock which is under low pressure. And so that rock will start melting. And that's the basic principle of decompression melting. Just drop the pressure and that will induce melting. So where do we find this particular thing happening? Well, we tend to find it at spreading ridges. So what we have is a situation. I'm just going to jump to the next slide. Here we go. So this very crude diagram represents a spreading ridge in the middle of the ocean. Okay. Now notice over here, this is standard oceanic lithosphere. It has a thickness between 50 and 140 kilometers. Okay. And this line here represents the 1300, 1400 isotherm. So below this line here in the dark green field, temperatures are greater than 1300 to 1400. So it, it's hot down here. Above this line in the lighter green field, temperatures are less than 1,300, 1,400 degrees Celsius. Now, when we come to the spreading ridge over here, you'll notice the crust is considerably thinner. We're down to just five to seven kilometers of crust. Now, this means if you're a rock over here, yes, the temperature is very, very high, but the amount of crust pushing down on you, should I say lithosphere pushing down on you, is also very, very high. So that means this rock right here is under high pressure and high temperature. So if we jump back to our previous slide here, what we have is we have a rock that's, yes, under a very high temperature, but the pressure is also very, very high. And so that means the geotherm is not going to come in contact with the melting curve. Now, what we need to do is we need to produce an environment where essentially the pressure is much lower, but the temperature stays high, because that's going to drive our geotherm up to, until it eventually hits our melting curve. So where do we have that? Well, we have that right there. In this area, we have a very, very thin bit of crust. It's only five to seven kilometers. That's not a lot of weight pushing down on this area of the mantle. So the pressure is, comparatively speaking, compared to this location over here, much, much lower. So you have low pressure, but your rock is still at temperatures equal to or greater than 
1,300 to 1,400. So your rock is very, very hot, but the pressure is comparatively quite low. And so what does that rock do? It starts melting. Because what, what all that's happened is, is we've taken our rock that was under high temperature but high pressure and it couldn't melt, and we've simply taken that rock and we've decreased the pressure whilst maintaining the same temperature, and we've driven it to the point where our rock is now meeting the melting curve, where it will start to melt. And so the most common location where we have this happening is at spreading ridges. So decompressional melting only really tends to be associated with the melting of mantle rocks. And so when we melt mantle rocks through decompression melting, we end up forming mafic or ultramafic magmas. We don't really tend to form felsic or intermediate. So spreading ridges are commonly associated with mafic and ultramafic magma because we are melting mantle rocks. And mantle rocks are what we melt to make mafic and ultramafic magma. So what's our final type of melting? Well, the final type of melting is hydration melting, also referred to as flux melting. Now, in this instance, we're not changing the temperature and we're not changing the pressure. What we're doing is we're adding water or carbon dioxide to our rock. So you're thinking, well, hold on a minute. What, what's that actually going to do? Well, it's actually going to decrease the melting point of our rock. So you're thinking, I don't quite get that. Well, let's think of a more, you know, a, a situation that you may have come across. And that situation is ice. Now, we all know that ice has a melting point of zero degrees Celsius. So the question is, though, is, well, what happens if you're in a situation where it's cold? Let's say it's down at, you know, minus five, minus 10 degrees Celsius, and you have a load of ice and you really want to get rid of that ice, what can you do to get rid of it? Well, the answer is you put salt on it. So why? Why put the salt on it? Well, what happens is, is the salt begins to dissolve into the ice. And the sodium and chlorine ions squeeze themselves in between the water molecules. And by squeezing themselves in between the water molecules, they break the attraction between the water molecules. And so all of a sudden, the water molecules can essentially begin to move freely. And so your solid, which has a rigid structure, begins to break down. And so that means your solid, your ice, will turn into a liquid water. And the same thing will happen with rocks. If you take a mantle peridotite and you start forcing water into it, well, what happens is, is the water begins to disrupt the bonds of the minerals that make up your rock. And so because it begins to destabilize the, the, uh, the minerals, essentially it induces them to melt. The addition of the water is helping to drive down the melting point of your, of your rock, or more accurately, the minerals in your rock. And so what happens in this situation is the geotherm stays exactly where it is. But by adding the water or the carbon dioxide, we drive the melting curve to lower temperatures. So it will eventually intersect the geotherm and your rock will start melting. So where do we find that happening? Well, that's most commonly associated with subduction zones. Because in the case of subduction zones, we have a piece of oceanic crust subducting down, which is absolutely stuffed with water. And so when you get down to about 150 kilometers, the minerals in your piece of oceanic crust that contain water, well, they begin to become unstable. And so at this point, they decide they really need to change into new minerals, which, are, which would be stable at the higher temperatures and pressures down here. And so the way they do that is by releasing the water. They get rid of the water. But the thing is that water has to go somewhere. And so that water enters the mantle peridotite right here. And as we've just discussed, all of a sudden you have a whole load of water forcing its way into these mantle peridotites. It starts destabilizing the minerals of the mantle peridotite and everything starts melting. And that's going to start producing mafic and ultramafic magmas. So if we just start over here on the 
uh, left hand side we can see we have our normal situation where we have the geotherm here in red the solidus here in green so this is the solidus of a, a mantle peridotite and you'll notice the two are well away from each other so the solidus is nowhere near the geotherm so your rocks are not melting now in the case of a spreading ridge we've already discussed how the main control is pressure so this is going to be decompressional melting so what happens is is the, is the solidus the melting curve stays exactly where it is but because we drop the pressure essentially we cause the curve to come straight up until it eventually intersects the geotherm so it's sorry let's try that again we cause the geotherm to come up until it intersects the solidus at which point we have melting once again we're melting mantle rocks so we're going to be forming mafic or ultramafic magma so then we have melting due to heat well in this case we have a couple of options here we have our mantle plume and our mantle plume has come shooting up from the core mantle boundary and our mantle plume is hot 1600 degrees celsius and so the sheer amount of heat from this mantle plume it comes flying up and the mantle plume gets stuck at the base of the crust here and so what happens is is the mantle plume will not only burn its way through the crust but as the magma is in contact with the crust here it actually starts melting it producing even more magma and that will feed volcanoes at the surface once again we are melting mantle rocks to do this so we're going to end up with a mafic or ultramafic magma now over here we've already discussed the piece of oceanic crust is going to be coming down it's going to dewater right here the water enters the peridotite here and that drives the solidus to the left until it intersects the geotherm and that's going to produce melting so our mantle rock is going to start melting now that's going to produce a mafic and ultramafic magma okay as you would expect the thing is is this mafic to ultramafic magma starts to rise up but it gets stuck at the base of the continental crust at this point you have a magma that's at 1400 degrees celsius in contact with granites which will start melting at around 700 degrees celsius and so obviously all the the granites at the base of the continental crust here well they're all of a sudden going to start melting aren't they and that's going to produce a felsic or intermediate magma which is going to rise up and feed the volcanoes at the surface so because in this instance we're actually melting the continental crust to make the magma that makes it to the surface the magma that appears here is going to be felsic to intermediate so that's why we have this slight difference in these situations here and here we are going to have a mafic or ultramafic magma because we're melting the mantle peridotite over here on the other hand we initially start by forming a mafic or ultramafic magma because we melt mantle peridotite but that magma gets stuck at the base of the crust and then it starts to melt the crust which will then give us a felsic or intermediate magma which will then rise to the surface and feed volcanoes so that's the grand model so once again we have decompression melting we have melting simply due to heating thermal melting and we have melting due to the addition of water hydration or flux melting and once again if you want to form a mafic or ultramafic magma you have to melt a mantle peridotite if you want to form a felsic or intermediate magma you have to melt continental crust so always remember that okay this is a great place to stop and so that's exactly what we're going to do so once again get up have a walk around go and get a drink of water and then come back in a few minutes once you've given your time mind a little bit of time to decompress all right see you soon